Excellent. So, first off, sorry for the small delay, but we have some issues. Um, very welcome to my first talk at this uh, ApacheCon um, at home. Perhaps before we really go into the topic, um, I wanted to get us um, a bit in the mood. So, um, what I prepared are some impressions on how it should look like, if we remember last year in Berlin. Um, oh, probably even like this. Um, and um, as we have many different time zones, um, what I prepared here is either a cup of coffee to, to start of the morning with you, or probably for the European guys. Um, it's time for the first beer, I guess. So, um, but now let's, yeah, it's beer. Um, okay, but now let's start the session. Oh, put myself a bit out of the, out of the way. The topic today is, um, no, no, that was coffee, okay. So the topic today is Apache LTDB growing a bilingual community. So um, let me shortly introduce myself, as you already have seen, I like beer and I like coffee, um, but more Apache related. Um, yeah, as you already know, my name is Julian Feiner. Um, here is what my batch would look like if you would see me now physically in front of you. And here are some of the projects um, I'm mostly involved with in the ASF. Um, and I mostly, uh, yeah, I thoroughly love. Um, one of them is incubated. That's why I'm here. And the other one is ITDB. That's, that's why I'm also here. Um, okay, so probably short discussion about what IoT DB is, it's in the end a database for the Internet of Things. So it's, it is a database overall, but it has a really nice architecture uh, to be able to really uh, consume very high amounts of time series data, which is um, really important in IoT applications, mostly in IoT applications. Um, is there an issue with my camera? Looks like. Um, can you still hear me? Okay, excellent. So I'll just, uh, I will just um, talk a bit. I don't know why the camera uh, went away and try to share my screen so that you can see my slide at least. Um, okay, so let's simply share my... Uh, simply try to share my screen. And um, now you should see my slides back again. Okay, excellent. So, um, well, not really a I guess. Today is an optimal day, technically speaking. Okay, um, what I wanted to tell you is a bit about the architecture of IoTDB. I'll just open the presentation and share it again with you. Um, then, then you can have a look. And, um, And um, it's a good, it's a, okay, so we should be back in, in a second. Yeah, so, okay. 
So here's the presentation. Um, so this is the architecture, but we will simply skip this uh, to, to get a bit of time back. Um, the short history of IoT DB, which is, a, I would say, a very successful history, is that um, it was accepted as a portling um, in November uh, 2018. And it is one of um, currently many, many young incubating projects which come from China. Um, and one important thing, which, which is true for most of those um, bottlings, is that the most all contributors, all initial contributors in this case, were native Chinese speakers. Some of them um, had good English skills. Um, I guess most of them had good English skills, but some of them were really unsure um, about uh, yeah. About the, the English skills are very uneasy speaking, so to say. And um, as other projects as well, the, the, there was nobody in the initial country, in this initial set of contributors, which had experience in the, in the Apache way overall or in any other major open source project, as far as I know. Um, and as the project came out of a university, it's in one university, which, see, which you see the logo over there. Um, there were several things which are a bit specific, I would say, for a for university. There was fluctuation among um, the contributors, as some of them were simply students, um, some of them were um, doing their PhD thesis and then went off to, to other things afterwards. Another important thing um, is that um, the focus was pretty much on implementation, on the algorithms, on, on very tiny details of uh, programming, and not so much on the uh, yeah on other things. Let's say this way. Um, okay, um, but the people were really highly motivated, as they were from university um, and researchers, and the skill set of many contributors was very high. Uh, there was a wide range of um, skills, I would say, but um, many of the many, uh, as there are some students which, which yeah, had some things still to learn, but many of the implementers were really, really talented um, and, and yeah, very good programmers. And this can be a good thing, but can also yeah, fire back a bit. Um, currently, Apache IDB is either the youngest top-level project or the, the second to the youngest top-level project. I'm not sure we should, should for, to, to clarify this, we should look in the board, board uh, in the last board, board meeting. Um, Apache IDB uh, has done nine Apache releases with five uh, release managers overall, which is also quite a nice range of only one guy being able to do this. But five people, um, tons of PRs, and uh, it's really getting some traction with about 900 stars on uh, GitHub. And there are many uh, companies, uh, widely known companies, uh, like Shanghai Metro or Lenovo, and others, which already use the software. So Apache IRTDB made it out of the incubator in less than two years, which I would say is pretty good. Um, and although, the initial, or when it initially started, there were some challenging circumstances, like uh, the, the Chinese, uh, the Chinese-speaking community, where some people had, had issues talking English and uh, no experience of open source at all, or with Apache Foundation in specific. So, what what I want to discuss a bit is how did the community make it so so uh, fast and, and so easy to to become that stable and that successful. Um, so we could think, okay, we could, could look up some of the matrix and this is some GitHub matrix. So, okay, they're, they're really good at programming and really there's, they, the community is really, really fast. I remember when I did the first release uh, between uh, two release candidates, there were 20 new comments and that was, to was totally overwhelmed. Um, but as you see also the, 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 the community gained 
a lot of track in, in 2019. So, so it went faster and faster. Um, so, so the community kind of grew. grew. Um, as you also see, there were about 50 commits or, or even more per week, which is yeah, quite impressive. Um, and also, yeah, you see overall it's, it's over 2 million uh, of lines of code, which we currently have in our code base. So is it just the, the speed and the, the, yeah, the ease of programming which makes made IITDB that successful? Um, and I would argue, no, not at all. I mean, that's, that's a nice fact, but as many people probably in this room would argue, um, especially in incubator, it's it's really not that much about the code. So how was all of that possible? Um, is it then probably because of, of the, the sheer power of IITDB? I mean, it has really impressive uh, stats in its domain. Um, you see it compared to other times, the HTTPs, it's really orders of magnitude, fast, magnitude faster. So is this why the community grew that fast? Uh, because it's simply so awesome. Um, and to answer that, I, I prepared uh, an example or two examples. So if we say, okay, it's simply because the project is so cool. And remember what I said, uh, there were many people not that familiar with the English language, uh, so to say. And when, when some outside contributors like I initially came there uh, and said, your project is really super cool. How can I join? What can I do? What are the open tasks? Um, then they could simply go like, okay, because all the communication project was Chinese back then. Even some comments were Chinese. Also, most of the documentation was, was at least partially Chinese. And if this would have been the response I, I had gotten, I would have been like, okay, well, I mean, I see that you that you, you, you have a Chinese is your mother tongue and probably it's easier for you, but I mean, I cannot, cannot work with that, basically. Um, or, or the other way around. Um, if I would simply come there and say, okay, I have an awesome idea for, for improvements and I write down a proposal, which is probably a bit lengthy, contains some technical terms, not the easiest English, then, then they could also be like, Okay, I, we don't understand what you're trying to tell us. Um, it, it just skip all the burden of uh, getting into this and, and discuss internally in, in Chinese, probably what what they, they think one could do. Um, so what we see from these examples, and which is something which at least I was not that used to, is that language can still be uh, some kind of frontier. Um, I mean, we are used to talking English all day long with people from all around the world, but especially when, when we're going to China, um, not everybody is uh, yeah, such a, let's say, well-trained English speaker, at least is, is so, so easy with speaking English. Probably it's also the culture that they are more humble um, and always think they are not as good as they usually are because many of, of most of the Chinese people I met speak really excellent English, at least compared to French people speaking <laughs> English. And that's another story. Um, so yeah, what, what can we do to, to um, break down the, the language barrier, at least uh, lower the language barrier? So one idea is simply stay mostly Chinese. I mean, China is pretty big and there's a lot going on in the open source scene in, in China. So we could say, okay, you can only join the core team if, if you speak Chinese, as this is what we want to do. Um, and I mean, there's tons of controversy in, in different mailing lists of the ASF about, um, is it okay to speak non-English or is it not okay? And, and what's inclusive? Is it inclusive uh, to force everybody to speak English because then everybody can understand? Or is it uh, more inclusive to allow everybody to speak whatever it's up to? Um, so, so one, is an, one extreme and an, an idea too is another extreme. So force all conversation to be in English uh, because you say, okay, this is how we do it. We want to be inclusive that everybody can read it. So we force you to speak English, but to force somebody to do some, 
some something is not that inclusive, I would say. So of course the, there's a third idea, and this is what I what I would say is pretty close to what we usually call the Apache way, is we rely on technology, we rely on the community, and we are pr pragmatic. Um, so official communication should, I would say, should be in English. Um, I don't know if it's somewhere stated in, in our bylaws, but it should be in English at least, that really everybody can understand what's happening there. Um, but uh, nowadays we have such nice tools to, to do um, tr machine translation. So there are many sites which you can use, simply copy in uh, some text and get uh, translation, which is most of the times not perfect, sometimes it's pretty funny, but in most situations you will get the essence of the text, although some sentences may be weird. Um, but what we also observe, we have uh, some uh, members in the community which, which are pretty confident in both languages, and they then just went on to fine-tune um, text. Or, for example, when I uh, took a took Chinese blog post and translated it to English, then I was able to, to polish the English well enough and yeah, basically fix all the, 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 the word sentences because I got the overall context of the text without knowing Chinese. And another thing is, which is also an old topic, um, accept inofficial channels. Um, you 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 uh, have to be pretty clear about when to go to the official channel, um, but but then you can easily accept inofficial channels where where languages can be different. For example, in the ITDB community, we have a WeChat group, as this is what what everybody's using in China, uh, where of course Chinese is spoken, um, and I will show an example later on. Um, and we have Slack as another uh, inofficial channel where most of the time we speak English. Um, but but whenever something important happens, we bring it to the list as, as you all, always should do, um, no matter what. And well, the last point is basically something you should not to uh, you should not say. Uh, but well, it's sometimes good to remember people. Uh, try to be kind and helpful, um, especially when you see that they are uneasy with, for example, speaking English, um, or if they are uneasy with sending mails to the list, which some people also are. There's some kind of uh, anxiety to, to send uh, mails to a list where 100 people will get the email. Then just help them or, or bring their topics to the list uh, and, and just help them to get the ideas out and get into the community. Um, uh, Nick, I, I see your question, but I'm not sure if I get it 100%. What do you mean with uh, workflow tools? So you mean if they are only like bullet points or what, what exactly do you mean? This is something, oh, it, it totally depends about the description. If the description is uh, more fluent, then um, it might work out. Um, in most cases, we had bilingual members of the community uh, translating Shira issues or GitHub issues. We had the idea uh, to, to uh, write some kind of plugin which automatically translates everything which is said in, in the GitHub discussion, but yeah, we, we were lacking the time. Um, so this is an example of communication in Chinese. I mean, I for myself, there's probably one sentence I can say in Chinese, and it this is this goes around the way Yao Yipin Pichu. Totally wrong pronunciation, but I mean it's the most language that I can say. I want a beer. Um, and nothing else. And especially I can't read any any uh, Chinese. But when you go to, to WeChat, um, then then you can pin on every message, and this is just a screenshot from my mobile. Uh, can present every message and get a translation. So the left thing is somebody uh, asking something, and this is a pretty short text, and you say the English text is, well, understandable. He's asking something about, uh, yeah, the, the, the configuration of the distribution of IoT clusters, um, or ask if he can provide the document, or probably also if there is a document provided. 
Um, and, and it goes on on the right side where someone is, uh, is saying, okay, there, there are no such documents. I mean, we're totally able to understand this. And then the green wave thing, this is a crazy thing out there, the green bubble, that's me speaking. And of course, I cannot speak Chinese, but on the mobile, you have those, uh, those uh, keyboards, which are basically more intelligent than, than uh, ourselves in the, in the near future, where you can simply type in English sentences and then it produces Chinese signs and you try to rely on it being what you want it to be and then you post it. Um, and I said something, I have no idea what I said there from the context, but I said something and then I get a response. Um, and also you see in this case, Yang Gong is, is kind and just switches to English to make it easier for me to read. Um, so it's something which is doable. And I'm sometimes hanging around. This is Chinese uh, chat room. Uh, it's a bit more work, but, but it works. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not like the, the uh, rhetoric club of, uh, of uh, big literature, but it works for communication. Another thing which we did and we still do is to maintain the homepage bilingual. So, so we have um, English and Chinese and basically, um, yeah, we, 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 each document is copied, um, which is some work, but, but uh, it makes it easy for users from both language regions to easily jump in the project, get, get a glimpse and, and have a place to ask for whenever they need some help. Um, other thing, the, the, the README document, in our case, we also have a Chinese README um, because we, we want to be inclusive, so to say, for, for all those primary Chinese speaking people. And it's important. Uh, so why don't have it there? I mean, it, of course, it's, it's some maintenance work which has to be done, but yeah, I mean, it, it makes it really easy for people to adopt the project. Um, so, of course, you can go on and argue and say, okay, but you do everything in two languages and this is verbose and it's not worth that. Why should they do this? And, and it can, things can, can, can get out of sync and stuff. And there are, I would say, very few people which are really able to compare the documents as you need to speak both languages uh, fluently enough. Um, okay, that's the point you can you can make it and it's a valid point. Eh? We, usually we say don't repeat yourself and doing the same text in two languages is, is probably a lot of repetition. But on the other hand, um, it's not that much effort to, to have the documents in two languages if it helps you to go over the limit of, of your community. Um, if we would insist on being having everything to be English, then I guess we would lose some of the Chinese contributors. Um, it's just tough for them. Um, as tough as it would be for me if everything was purely Chinese um, or from, from other people which, are not, which do not speak Chinese. So I would say it's, it's really small, small amount of effort to, to um, do this kind of paperwork compared to what you gain. Basically then you, you have the, the whole world being able to contribute, um, especially everybody from, from China, which is where the, the project is initially from, and everybody from around the rest of the world, the most of the rest of the world. Um, and this is the position I have. And then I think um, from an Apache side of things, this is the position we, we should really think about. Um, as it's kind of inclusive to provide all those languages if the community needs it or get some value out of it. So, um, yeah, basically near, near the end of my, uh, my talk, I listed seven things that I think were at least a part of the success we had with IRTB adopting that fast to the, to the, uh, to the Apache way and growing the community that fast. Um, and uh, yeah, which I just want to show you or discuss with you. Um, first thing, and it's not only true for bilingual projects or for projects from, from outside of China. Uh, and this is something uh, we're here in incubator track. So this is something uh, that people being in the incubator for some time, but I think 
agree on is um, there, there's some kind of mindset that has to be involved. So the industry contributors uh, do not only think, okay, if I give the project to the, to the Apache Foundation, then I have an open source project and top level project, and that's awesome. And then I might be famous or whatever. But if you want to come to the Apache Foundation and become a top level project, then you should have the mindset to grow your community. Um, and, and think about the success, not only in the sense of, okay, my algorithm is better than someone else's algorithm, but it, my community is healthy and uh, I make it easy for people to adapt and to join the project. Yeah, the hint is quite obvious. I mean, you can do, do code and copy and Apache license uh, headers and license file and copy it to GitHub, but well, then it's an open source project, but it's not, it will never be an Apache top level project. Second thing I would say, which went pretty smoothly, is um, you have to have uh, official channels. You have to do every every project has to decide for himself. I mean, mailing list. There's no discussion about it. this. Is simply how we do it. Um, but but do you want to use Jira for issues? Do you want to have GitHub? How do you want to have your processes? And then you really have to stick those to those processes um, because you should also establish unofficial channels. But, but you really have to have clear definition of when and where to be official and or not to be, because then you can easily hang around in WeChat or Slack or whatever. And, and when you know when there's the right point to go to the list or file an issue, issue or something, um, then you, you can have unofficial, cha unofficial channels uh, because you may not lose something. Um, if you if you yeah get get all the right things uh, to the right places uh, when, when the time has come. Another aspect which which was at least quite interesting for me was that there are lots of cultural differences which probably we don't see that much when we uh, are in projects together with German people and and probably uh, yeah people from Europe or people from Australia or people from the US. I mean, there, there, there are some minor cultural differences, I would say, and some topics you just not necessarily discuss. But, but China is uh, quite different culturally. And one important thing is, I think, try to understand the cultural differences which, which come on top of, of, the, of the language differences. And one thing I notice is some kind of humbleness. Uh, these people are more reserved sometimes but just because they're humble not because they're not willing or lazy or don't like you or something and so this is something you really have to to think about to yeah get get a good relationship with them um and i would say a, a big and important step for us was that we usually take the extra time for maintaining uh, those bilingual documents, uh, documentation, we have documentation in, in, in two languages, how to do releases and stuff, um, because it makes it way easier for new developers and users to adopt the project. Um, funny side note is we, we initially had um, pretty good uh, English documentation, how to do releases, because we copied it from another project. And then someone went on to translate it to China and left out one or two points. And for some time, we, we always had issues with, with, uh, um, with releases done by, by Chinese uh, contributors um, until we, we, someone found it out. Um, but, but there you see that, that those people always will consult the Chinese page, of course, because it's easier. Um, and, and, but for us, there's no question to, because we, we can't consult the Chinese page. Um, and the last thing is, is again, this no-brainer um, that I still decided to leave it in here. Be nice, be forgiving, be motivating. Um, because those, those people are really, as, as well as you're learning a lot of things, those people are also learning a lot of things in, in the open source project. And it's, it's different than, than the, the, the hierarchical culture they may be coming from. Um, and, and they may have other reasons for, for doing the decisions they do and doing the things they do. And 
be always nice, be forgiving, of course, and also try to motivate them. Don't try to do to, this to by being by punishing them or by being rough, like, ah, okay, you're never right to the list, so, so you will never make it. Uh, be motivating uh, whenever they write, someone writes to the list, welcome them. I mean, I remember we, we sometimes we, we left votes open pretty, pretty long to really get many PMCs to vote because some of them, yeah, just in, in the start were humble to participate and how to check a release and there's so many things you can do wrong and all that stuff. So, and we really left the vote open pretty long as we said, okay, we want to have a lot of PMCs to vote. Um, and then this, this turned out to be pretty uh, helpful. In the end, uh, probably summing up a bit, uh, my talk in the end, all those seven lessons um, I, I had said and all those examples I had given boil down, I would say, to one single sentence. And this is community overcode. And this is, um, as many of you may know, kind of the unofficial uh, motto we have. Um, but in the end, I would say IoTDB was not that successful because it has the best code. Um, or because it has, it is so impressive technically, but because really everybody in the community worked on building a community. And if, if you have a good community, then code will come by itself. But if you have good code, that does not necessarily mean that the community will come by itself. If you're not welcoming and, and, and you're yeah, not trying to make it easy for people to adopt. So this, this is basically what sums it up. Um, I, I was trying to give you some examples of, of um, yeah, what we what we observed in the IoTDB project. And as we have multiple uh, incubating projects which, which were initiated in, in China, um, it might probably be interesting for one or the other to, to yeah, try to follow some of the path we have taken to grow the community. Um, this basically concludes my talk. Um, and when you have some questions or comments, then speak them up. And once again, sorry for the inconvenience about the setup. Thank you, Justin. So I will cheer on you. I mean, I think one thing which is not optimal is that the, the um, time zone is a bit tough for the Chinese part of the community. Um, some of them may already be asleep. But in the end, I mean, it's also not that convenient for Justin, I think. <laughs> so. Okay, so I hope I'm good in time. I totally lost track, but I think I am. Oh, yeah, Justin, that's rough. So you go with beer or coffee? Both. Craig, uh, speaking excellent German. Okay, so I guess uh, my time is over. I will leave the stage for the next. Um, probably I will um, uh, do a little bit of announcement as I'm not sure if we do have those announcements and I usually like them. Um, so next will be um, Wilfried Spiegelenburg and Bang Da Tan, uh, who will talk about past, now, and future about Apache Unicorn, an incubating project, which is a cloud native resource category. I will go off the, the booth. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the next talk. Bye.